um, semester. And we take then, so to speak, a two week rest. That is a two week uh, hyper active productive race towards the end of year. And then we all gather, I think, here um, for the Dean's Honor Lecture with the Wolf Picks on the Wednesday, the 29th, 7th, I think it is. But before that, I have the pleasure tonight to introduce Daniel Norell, and I think also all of you know him since he was with us for a review not too long ago, and that was the review um, for the students who are currently in, our, in the second semester. And you know how it goes, it's um, not knowing someone and then having the pleasure of meeting that person. It's true, it can go... It's not really about going into two different ways, that it works or doesn't work. But it is a certain... Um, there's an uh, absolute delight in discovering that there is everything, everything in place for an ongoing conversation and an engaging conversation. And this was the case with Daniel. He studied architecture in Stockholm at the Royal Institute of Technology, or, yeah, Royal Institute of Technology. He finished there his master in 2003. Um, I believe you went on to work in Swedish offices a little bit, but soon enough you moved on to um, do another master at, <coughs> sorry, at UCLA. And, um, that you finished in the studio of Greg Lynn in 2006. You went on to um, work for him. And then you went on to work for Saha Hadid Architects in London. Two years, 2007 till 2009. And obviously with that, I suppose part of that um, platform for a conversation is, was installed by your spending that time in the US and obviously working with, studying and working with um, people truly engaging and um, people hugely invested in um, contemporary issues in architecture. You took that, Daniel took that to um, back to Stockholm. He um, taught at the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm uh, from 2009 till 2012. Um, and that year when you ended at uh, the Royal Institute, you founded with your partner Norell, um, uh, Norell Rude, um, sorry, Norell Rude uh, Architecture. It's a uh, practice, and I believe we are privileged to see some of your work today. And then you went to work at um, Chalmers University of Technology. This is in Gothenburg on the um, uh, west coast of, of, of Sweden. And that's where you are today, where you also direct the master's program. And, um, and I also know, uh, yeah, and on the way there, um, at one point you also took a so-called licenciate. It's a degree that is, I hope I get this right, it's about a three-quarter um, PhD. And it exists in a few countries, I believe France has it, Finland, Stockholm, Sweden, um, and on the basis also of this, uh, you have uh, of recently acquired a rather unique position at Chalmers where um, you, are, uh, you will be doing, conducting research uh, in order to complete that, which will be a future PhD. Um, part, of the, part of the premise of, of, for, for the conversation that I started, started with referring to um, definitely has to do with uh, uh, Daniel's engagement with technology. Um, he has stated um, how he and his partner, how they critically investigate the use of new design mediums, and that's principally software, digital fabrication and interactive technologies. Um, this obviously goes to explore new possibilities for architectural design and it deals with the role of these mediums in the design process as well as the role in the actual construction of built structure but with an emphasis on the former. This design research is an exploration that I believe sits within your work as much as in your teaching and 
Technology, you have argued, becomes a way of rethinking, augmenting, or interrogating aspects of fundamental architectural concepts, such as representation, materiality, tectonics, and form. And I suppose that would be enough said to somehow um, align interests and um, certainly also justify my um, initial statement that having met Daniel was also meeting someone that I think it's um, truly engaging to, um, to enter into conversation with about work and about the future of architecture. And Daniel, we're delighted that you're here tonight and very excited to hear you. Thank you. Thank you, Johan, for that very kind uh, introduction. It was almost like having uh, my CV read back to me. <laughs> um, and um, of course, it's a, it's a pleasure and uh, an honor to be speaking here at the Städelschule. And as Johan pointed out, my first encounter with this uh, institution was earlier this year, when I, was, when I was on review. So nice to see so many familiar faces. Uh, and um, when I was here, I was impressed with the work and the agenda uh, for the first semester group set by Damian and Johan. And also on a more profound level, I was uh, pleased to find that the culture of the Städelschule architecture class seemed to place an emphasis on the interplay between speculative design and discourse, uh, which is something that we, my partner Einar and I, um, place a lot of value in, in our practice and in our teaching as well. Uh, and it's something that hopefully becomes apparent in the lecture. <clears throat> but before delving into the work and the topic of the talk, uh, I wanted to briefly give a bit of background on our practice and, and uh, uh, how it came about. So as Johan said, um, a few years ago, uh, actually both of us had been living um, abroad for a while. We moved back to Stockholm uh, and once back there we soon realized that there was very little infrastructure for speculative or experimental work and so that's to say that there weren't many, uh, you know, there's not a whole um, set of uh, prizes for young architects or galleries that exhibit work or um, there is no uh, MoMA PS1 program or anything like that. But, and, but maybe that's changing right now, so that's, that's good, changing slowly. But one thing that there is in, in Sweden and also all over Scandinavia is um, open competitions. And that's typically uh, uh, how uh, young architects um, kind of get into, make a name for themselves is part by, and, and, and open up new uh, ways of getting commissions is through those uh, competitions. And we have turned it into a habit to participate in open competitions. And in fact, we, we found the resources to uh, start our, uh, found our practice uh, thanks to uh, winning a second prize in a competition. Also, what's, what's interesting with working with competitions is that uh, you work in wildly different contexts. Uh, so in the lecture, I, I will partly take you through an odd kind of grand tour uh, of different sites, uh, mostly in Scandinavia, but also in, uh, throughout Europe. And it's a tour that, as I'm sure most of you are aware of, in, often involves no actual traveling, but rather you get an understanding for uh, a project through um, 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 uh, you know, the, the mediation of Google Maps or downloaded images. <clears throat> so um, the architects that uh, we look up to, um, um, uh, they are not only invested in producing work, but they also speak, write, exhibit, and review. And we try to do so uh, too whenever we have the possibility. So let's say besides uh, um, uh, uh, trying to get our work published, we, we often take part in independent or very small obscure publications or exhibitions. And to us it's important to try and build and be part of a conversation that works across architecture schools, uh, maybe small fanzines, exhibitions, and things like that. 
We also organize uh, lectures and events in Stockholm, and it's something that has helped us to kind of build a network of uh, other young practices, both in Europe and in the US. Uh, here is Jimena Sly of Buru Spectacular lecturing in Stockholm uh, in a lecture series that I co-curated for the KTH and the Stockholm Association of Architects. And I think that it's fair to say also that that's, imp that, that, that's important because we're, we're, we're way up north. So we're not, uh, 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 unlike maybe in Frankfurt where there is a flow of interesting guests in, uh, uh, in the architecture world coming through on a regular basis, that's not necessarily the case in Stockholm or in Gothenburg. Um, apart from uh, presenting uh, at conferences and uh, being part of exhibitions, we also regularly participate in design reviews in architecture schools in Sweden as well as abroad. And as Johan mentioned, uh, sometimes uh, in the US, thanks to uh, my background uh, from there. <clears throat> um, I wanted also to briefly touch on uh, teaching. Um, and as Johan mentioned, I teach at, at Chalmers in Gothenburg. My partner, Einar, teaches at um, uh, the College of Arts, Crafts and Design in Stockholm. And we view teaching as a very important and, and uh, integrated part of our practice. And often issues that we are working on in, in practice go back, kind of back and forth between academia and back to practice. <clears throat> and these are some results from a graduate seminar focusing on character that I taught uh, with a colleague uh, a couple of years ago at Chalmers in Gothenburg. And these are some examples from ongoing research done with master's thesis students. And uh, this particular project was about working with objects and materials that are normally considered uh, waste or trash. In this case, uh, what, uh, what's referred to as ocean plastic. So these are actual um, salvaged materials and objects that on the left-hand side has been uh, 3D scanned and on the right-hand side has been um, heated in a specially built uh, oven to uh, create new uh, flat pieces of material and new um, uh, kind of lumps of material. And one issue that these guys were working with was to what extent when, when you uh, salvage materials and reuse them, is the identity of the material preserved in the process? So they referred to you know, something like this. Let's see if I can get my mouse to work. Something like this, uh, they refer to as a fossil, <laughs> when when uh, a part of a uh, when a piece of melted plastic is identifiable within a larger uh, agglomeration. This is uh, images from a project that was just presented last week at Chalmers, um, and this was a play with digital contextual information, uh, such as meshes or. Um, uh, image maps of facades that you can download and extract from 3D map applications. Uh, and the project ended up in a building design, uh, as a building design project and a, a sort of a thesis about what it means to be contextual in architecture when context is something that you can download and extract and, and manipulate and then use as a basis for design. And this is actually work that I think I mentioned to Johan and Damian uh, last time I was here. The project was then in, in progress, um, but I don't think I ever got around to show it to you. Um, and this particular work was about using processes native to glitch art uh, in architecture, such as misalignment, data bending, and data moshing. And so what that means essentially is that drawings, digital models, or photographs of architectural elements uh, are pulled through software that is typically not used in architecture, like for, like for example sound edi editing software in this case, which then uh, shows up as um, uh, once, once you, you, you kind of grapple with it, uh, it can create pretty interesting architectural effects. And finally, a studio uh, from a few years ago when we designed and constructed small buildings co uh, from robotically cut EPS foam and exhibited them as kind of a scenography in a large uh, hall at the university. <clears throat> 
Back to practice, um, we are always working with, uh, I have to admit, varying degrees of success on a couple of commissions for private residences, often in Stockholm. And several, several of these houses um, uh, explore a kind of playful monumentality uh, through pro things like proportions, fenestration and materiality. So the idea would be how can you make something small, like in this case a 120 square meter house, uh, seem big and significant, but just playing with, uh, yeah, again, proportions, color, materiality. Uh, in a fairly historical city like Stockholm, uh, many of our projects are also conversions. Um, like here, when the entire uh, roof of a six-story apartment building in Stockholm is removed, and this is a typical process for a kind of attic renovation in Stockholm to enable a new uh, apartment and new domestic spaces. Uh, or extensions, like in this case, uh, where a client of ours bought a small uh, outhouse on an uh, other than that empty lot outside of Stockholm, and uh, here's a house that's now under construction that uh, extends that very small house into a much larger uh, residence. However, the, the work that I wanted to talk ab about today is mostly of speculative nature. It's competitions as well as smaller scale projects like installations and interiors. And to us, um, this work, upon reflection, suggests how architecture might communicate through use of form, texture and color. And how such a use may, up, may open up alternative approaches to communication that rely on things like faint resemblances and multiple states of attention. <clears throat> so essentially we li we'd like to think about communication as a kind of conversation, as the title suggests, between architecture and its audiences, uh, and between subjects and objects, or sometimes even between objects and objects. Communication is, of course, uh, a recurring subject in architecture. Uh, uh, in the 70s, uh, Charles Jenks conceptualized figuration as a, quote, mode of architectural communication that relies on metaphor. It typically involves the subject seeing and interpreting the mass of one building as another or as an object. In more recent years, communication has reappeared in architectural discourse. And uh, a shift perhaps took place in this 2005 issue of Quaderns, where Alejandro Sarapulo, along with critical responses from Sylvia Levin and Jeff Kipnis, argued for iconographic figuration as a, an expedient way for architects um, to explain and justify their designs. Uh, particularly in the eyes of the public. Uh, so figure, in short, for Sarapulo became a way to assign a, quote, consumable image to significant large-scale urban developments. And I think we all know where that went with uh, bird's nests and uh, gherkins and things like that. But um, while these and other projects at the time pointed to the figure's capacity for sort of humanizing architecture, um, they nevertheless limited its impact to a one-dimensional reading. So for instance, uh, once you name something a bird's nest and market it as that, uh, the suggestive figure of the, that stadium is unlikely to give rise to other associations. <clears throat> Today, I think we can sense a growing anxiety with communication that, on, that um, relies on readily uh, comprehensible meaning to architecture through iconography. And I think instead our practice and many of the practices that we would like to consider our peers seek ways to employ communication that is much less overt and more ambiguous in nature. And it's in light of those recent events uh, that we are compelled to argue for a different concept of communication architecture, one that productively opens up a multitude of readings. So in fact, uh, the, the title of the lecture um, uh, in conversation is, is maybe misleading because the type of communication that we often favor is one that is deliberately vague or multivalent, let's say. So in order to talk more about this in detail in relation to the work, uh, 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 I structured the lecture under these four terms, noise, 
characters, found forms and materialities and supergroups. And uh, th th these are the headlines that I will kind of start to group the work around. But, it's all, but I also want to, to make clear that none of the work falls exclusive, exclusively into one of these categories. So I think, in fact, man, a lot of the work is, uh, could go into many of these categories. <clears throat> Uh, so when, when we started working together a few years ago, we were obsessed with this idea of noise in architecture. And at the time, um, our interest in noise, in noise um, was really a re reaction to the control achievable in digital design and to the strive for perfect high resolution representation in things like renderings and digital fabrication. Of course, normally as an architect in daily practice, uh, precision in execution is key. But uh, for this and some of our other work, uh, we have deliberately uh, tried to relinquish control. And thanks to our friend uh, Kivi Sotama, who I know lectured here just last week, right? Um, we were invited to do an um, installation right, when, right at the time when we had started the practice at Aalto University in Helsinki, where Kiwi ran something called the Aalto University Digital Design Laboratory. And this project um, explored the tension between geometric precision um, and erratic material behavior. And it stood as a kind of large, uh, mysterious figure in the gallery and cafe at AD. And the other thing that we wanted to do with the project was to let the installation be uh, a, a, a kind of large, uh, fairly dumb, discrete object in size somewhere between furniture and a small building. And again, at the time, this was as opposed to a lot of work that had been going on for a while, where installations or uh, work in galleries by architects would start to merge or, uh, with, with walls or surfaces in the gallery space and sort of become a, like a background. While designing the piece, we started talking about it as a large boulder or rock, which seemed like a perfect match in terms of you know, conceiving something like a big discrete object. And as a game of words, we decided to, that the massing of the installation should take, it, take its cues from an erratic block, one of those large stone boulders that have been tumbled and transported by glacier ice. Glacier ice. They can be found all over the Nordic region. I, I'm not sure if you have them in Germany, but probably uh, in northern Germany you can find them. And often they have this, uh, this special appearance in that they have been they seem displaced. They are outside of their normal context because the eyes pick them up and, and deposited them somewhere else. And they also have a particular appearance in that they have been rounded off and uh, uh, sort of almost uh, polished by the ice. Um, to sketch out the project, basically, we did a series of model studies using uh, uh, off-the-shelf material simulation uh, that were all based on the massing of these blocks. And each designed erratic was turned into somewhat of an individual through things like balance, posture, and surface articulation. Um, and if you look closely here, you can see how the installation was constructed from a gigantic soft sack that was constrained in many points. Um, uh, uh, that, uh, that basically made the surface uh, bend and furl as if it was experiencing sudden bursts of noise or random noise. And in the gallery space, it's, it started to shape space around itself while its inside uh, remained inaccessible. We also became interested in how figuration could support multiple states of attention. In other words, how the reading of the piece uh, as an erratic boulder could coexist with other readings that become visible on a closer uh, inspection or at a closer range. So we started. So when we designed it, we started see, to see if we could tease out uh, things like faces or uh, other vaguely reminiscent. Uh, features uh, from all those folds of fat. 
So this idea that we as uh, humans can perceive meaning in seemingly random data or in random patterns is something that we have explored in a few projects. Uh, and uh, artist uh, Hito Steyrl uh, has pointed out that noise um, or not being able to see anything intelligible is kind of the, no the new normal. So uh, the example that Steyrl uh, refers to is the scrambling of the Snowden files uh, that makes their content a secret uh, or inintelligible. But any human being, according to Steyrl, would immediately decrypt them and see something anyway, um, like in the left-hand image here. Uh, so you, you, would, you would look at this for a little while and then you would see a surface of water uh, uh, glimmering in the evening sun, for instance. And it struck us uh, when thinking about this that in architecture materials can add this kind of noise. Uh, as in, for instance, you know, a canonical example would be Mises Barcelona Pavilion, where the intense patterning <coughs> of marble panels interrupt an otherwise very controlled and abstract space. This take on what the material, or rather the image of a material, can do is something that we have recently returned to in an installation that was part of this year's Architecture Biennale in Venice. And the project, uh, titled Drain Figures, uh, was part of an exhibition called Plots, Prints, Projections uh, that Ulrika Karlsson, whom I know is a friend of Johan's as well, uh, curated, uh, uh, and the, the exhibition featured large-scale structures by six new Swedish architecture practices. So uh, the kind of background to this project was that uh, the visible grain in a piece of wood uh, often appears as a recognizable form or pattern, and that, that's something that, that uh, uh, carpenters use, and it's known in carpentry as grain figures. And so it's a way basically for carpenters to visually examine a piece of wood and be able to tell something about both its visual qualities but also its structure, let's say, by looking at the figure of the grain. So grain figures uh, are norm normally referred to as, for example, beer claws or crowns or bird's eyes or burls or curls or fiddlebacks or quilts, and you can see some of them uh, in here, all of, all of these, I think, are from pretty, pretty exotic uh, kinds of um, wood. But these features in the grain that we see uh, here, they're, they're in, in, in two pieces of plywood, they're a result of the, the lathing of, of the veneer in the plywood. So you know how they make plywood from a spiraling section through a log. The, the log is cut almost like on a, on a cheese grater. Uh, uh, so it's like a spiraling section that cuts through knots and defects in the wood, and that's what's in turn generating the pattern of the plywood. So what we did was to carefully select six sheets of pine plywood that were documented in high-resolution photographs. And we then started to uh, draw on top of them uh, almost like a game of seeing these uh, figures or not seeing them. And we, it was a very basic setup. We drew, we drew these curves quickly and then they became tool paths for a CNC router. And you know, uh, 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 it, it, it was important also for us to, to have a uh, to, uh, let's say, with, with the product for the Biennale, you're always under the gun, because the Biennale is always announced uh, quite late uh, in, in relation to when it opens. So it's a product that you have to, especially if it's something that you have to manufacture big scale to, it's something that you have to uh, pull through rather quickly. Um, anyway, so in this, in, the, in this way, the image of the material became a canvas for the design, but not a blank canvas, but one that contained already some agency. Uh, so rather than departing from geometry, let's say, and then sort of let material fill out that geometry, we started with the material almost like a, as a kind of basis for drawing. And here's the installation in the Sara de Giardini greenhouse. It's I know that some of you, or most of you maybe, went to, went to Venice this year. So this is right, I don't know, if you go back, you can, 
uh, go here, it's right outside the Giardini in a small uh, greenhouse that's open to the public. So on a massing scale, um, select uh, curves in the variation of grain produce a set of figurative elevations that can be, we kept it deliberately open uh, whether this was uh, uh, you know, a, 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 a piece of furniture or um, um, a scale model or a map of a terrain or a, 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 a something full scale. Um, and here you can see some of the glazing in the greenhouse and behind here to the left uh, is a piece from our friends uh, Space Popular from L London and here is an interactive display system that was placed throughout the space by Swedish practice Gron. So a closer reading of the surface reveals some of these local features in the grain and how the curvature loosely adjusts to those. Uh, and um, we wanted those figures to be measurable against a, a grid in the background. Uh, but it's also the case, I don't know if some of you have worked with plywood, that, uh, you know, because plywood is an is a artificial material of many uh, thin layers, you can only follow the grain on one side. Like on the, on the back side, uh, there is a different uh, layer of veneer. So uh, you can only work with it one-sided, basically. Uh, other than the theme of uh, plots, prints, and projections, uh, the curator Ulrika Karlsson tasked all the participating architects, uh, including us, to work with wood. So this was another um, thing that was important to us with this piece, was that we wanted to emphasize plywood as a kind of artificial material built of several thin layers. <clears throat> Um, and we were lucky to work with a carpenter uh, in Stockholm that turned out to be a really uh, good uh, find for us and that we are probably going to come back to in the future. And what was nice with that was that, of course, they had all the you know, um, CNC routers and all of that, but it was also nice to be able to work with them because they're master craftsmen. And in fact, the, the, the reason why we could keep the installation so... Um, without any visible tectonics, uh, screws, um, uh, dowels, and things like that, was thanks to um, their craftsmanship. So, it, like, funnily, the, the, the fact that we had access to really good craftsmanship made it possible to hide all tectonics and hide all details. Uh, and it was also uh, an interesting experience in that uh, one of our staff from the office uh, spent a lot of time in the, in the workshop here with the workshop master, which made it possible to um, um, have a really smooth process, especially when it came to exchange of files and CNC routing, <clears throat> which was something I... Uh, um, um, appreciated a lot because I don't, you know how it is sometimes that because you know a lot about uh, because you have a background in digital fabrication uh, that can sometimes also make things more difficult because you're trying to step outside what, what normally a carpenter is using his or her machine for but in this case thanks to a close collaboration uh, th this turned out to be a very good experience and um, yeah. At the moment, uh, we're also happy to have landed our first institutional client. And so we have been commissioned to develop one floor of an historical military building on an island in, right in the heart of Stockholm into spaces and studios for the Royal Institute of Art, a major art school in uh, Stockholm. <clears throat> and. Um, uh, that ha has turned out to be an interesting uh, commission, uh, and it's also very interesting uh, for a change to have, you know, uh, well, be in client meetings where, where, where all the representatives of the client are art, prof art professors. 
But this building is, is, is quite an interesting building in that it uh, started as a one level storage building here shown in pink. Uh, uh, that was built around 300 years ago, and then it has grown gradually, st step by step, uh, over the centuries in all directions. So, on the interior, which is where we uh, uh, do work in this project, uh, it's kind of monstrous building with many different structures interwoven and details uh, that are both uh, kind of ugly recent details, but also historical details in a kind of wild mix. The project is now under construction and some demolition has taken place, which you can see in the left-hand uh, image. Um, uh, and again, it reveals, um, uh, because this is, a mil is an old military building and a, a production facility where they in fact used to make bombs, there is nothing in the interior that is uh, uh, protected. So although there are historical details, it's not protected. So, which is something you, you can see here that there are many different ugly new installations that show, show up once you start to demolish. But what's interesting with this is perhaps that uh, the building has a kind of narrative from different ages and phases, as in these patched up floors, for instance. So that's something that we uh, turned into a theme in the design. Uh, so rather than going for a kind of coherence, we have tried our best to emphasize the moments where the building elements from various times uh, are in conversation or even in conflict. So this axonometric shows a little bit of how we're transforming the interior. Um, this is going to be a new home for students and faculty working with photography, video, multimedia, and digital print. And in the front part here, you have what the client calls uh, discursive spaces. So it's, it's seminar rooms and, uh, where, where discourse is taking place, basically. And in the back, you have the uh, editing rooms and um, computer rooms and the large uh, film studio. Uh, and so th there are many things to pick up on here, but one interesting fact that we uh, uh, choose to base our design on, on is to make a kind of copy of the existing facade and insert it here to also show off that these ye columns that were painting yellow, they, um, they were inserted much later once the building started to grow vertically. So they are not in sync with the facade. So normally you would never have a series of columns in the interior that are sort of out of sync uh, with the facade. Here's just a quick study rendering that highlights uh, those existing columns and the window. And here, uh, I wonder, or this, hmm. um, uh, here the row of hand-to-hand uh, -hand, uh, forking columns that continue through uh, all the front uh, rooms in the project. On to characters. We often think of buildings or pieces of furniture that we design as characters. So we try to, let's say, give them a certain personality through design. To describe character, we keep coming back to uh, the work of Bernd and Hilla Bechers uh, and their photographs of derelict industrial structures. So as probably many of you know, these structures were photographed often but not always in frontal view and compiled into collections of structures with similar formal features. So these collections of sort of objective portraits of buildings, they, they in an interesting way start to reveal the idiosyncrasies of each individual structure, its character if you want. So through things like structure, proportions, fenestration, and I kind of love the fact that if you look at this, um, if you look at one of these collections for some time, you can almost begin to detect a certain personality in each building. So they can be either balanced or unbalanced, uh, pompous or informal, tall or squat, etc. And it's in, uh, and it's also funny to think that just because we see them next to each other. You know, you can detect a certain humor in each uh, structure that wouldn't be, you wouldn't be able to see if you just visited one of these sites, let's say. 
<clears throat> so living and working in Stockholm, we became interested in doing work that targeted the particularities of the city. And we started to pay attention to Stockholm's smallest public buildings, like uh, phone booths and photo booths, as well as uh, uh, urinals and public restrooms. And in Stockholm, these structures, uh, these, ki these kinds of buildings are currently uh, a concern simply because they're becoming extinct. So in 2015, when we started this work, is when they removed almost all phone booths from the streets of Stockholm, which seemed like a perfectly innocent uh, thing to do, but if you think about it, may have an effect on public space. Um, and we noticed that all of these booths are immediately recognizable as small figures in the urban fabric. And what also caught our interest uh, was that they are deeply ingrained in public consciousness and, of course, also in popular culture. You know, you can think of, for instance, uh, uh, Superman's use of uh, uh, phone booths or um, uh, David Bowie being photographed in, photographed in a Soho phone booth. And all the existing kiosks that we looked at in Stockholm, here shown in white, uh, shared one thing. They have an interior entirely shaped after the human body, and their sort of anthropomorphic features include vertical proportions, symmetry, and a clear division into enclosure, base, and uh, roof. Or if you want, uh, head, torso, and legs. And through uh, multiple projections of these uh, silhouettes that we had uh, drawn of the existing booths, we designed mysterious near copies of them that would start to, at least, at least as we imagine it, uh, re replace uh, removed booths. And hence the, dead, the name, dead ringers, meaning copies. So these strangely familiar figures are a play on the proportions and the iconic nature of Stockholm's existing uh, booths. And because they sample and mix uh, silhouettes from several of them, each uh, dead ringer would appear different depending on how you approach it. So these are two photographs of the same uh, uh, big uh, model that we first um, um, uh, made in the office. And some of the viewing angles will reveal a silhouette that is near identical with, it, with one of the historical booths. And moving along, the same silhouette may uh, subtly shift into a lopsided or, or sculptural mix of two different ones. So our dead ringers, like the original booths, would be visible as small characters in the urban fabric. But unlike their sort of perfectly proportioned forefathers, they would be disfigured or lopsided or weirdly postured. So last year, uh, we were commissioned by ARCTES, which is the new uh, National Center for Architecture and Design in Stockholm, to design and develop a new full-scale dead ringer for an upcoming exhibition. And this exhibition, titled Public Luxury, was the first one under the new director, Kieran Long's, um, curatorship. <clears throat> and the exhibition uh, is open now, it opened last week, and it gathers large-scale uh, commissions, installations, and projects that all sort of tell stories about uh, the struggle for public life. So it's basically design projects that target how public space is changing at the moment, both with regards to um, activism, but also with regards to, as in our case, technological shifts or th even threats of terrorism, let's say. <clears throat> so here's uh, our dead, dead ringer in the museum uh, facing a kind of staged uh, square uh, with a bench and a light post by Swedish architect Johannes Nolander. Uh, so this is one of the views of the uh, dead ringer that appears as a mix of two different originals. Uh, whereas this view is close to a frontal view that reveals the silhouette of one of the earliest uh, turn of the century phone booths in Stockholm. Uh, 
and walking, when we were walking around the, 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 the piece on the opening, we also really liked the fact that in some views the overall form uh, seems to fall into the projection plane of the facade, whereas other parts in the same view may start to break out or twist out of the very same uh, plane. So it's a, the, 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 the piece in itself is kind of like a play between a 2D elevation and the three-dimensional mass. And we'll, we'd like to think about this as, as architecture, that, but that has the ability to kind of talk back to you. So it's, it's neither uh, silent, nor does it have, let's say, the kind of instant appeal of excessive beauty that we have become used to through typical approaches to digital design. And I, rather, maybe its effects are felt more slowly as it's discovered step by step uh, by a visitor who may almost enter into a kind of conversation with the object, uh, as strange as that may sound. Uh, and here's from the opening night, and uh, we, we quite like this uh, view of the piece standing as a kind of majestic figure in a sea of uh, uh, people uh, uh, kind of floating around it. So again, uh, to round off that project, a bit of manufacturing. Um, I'm, 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 I'm talking about this not, not because I, I want to make a big deal out of how these things were made. Uh, but, but it's, it has been important for us as a practice to, you know, uh, when you're in school or when you teach, you're used to having good access to digital fabrication equipment. But th there comes a point when you also have to uh, find that stuff professionally and when you can't rely on, you know, um, uh, your facilities uh, in the school through interns or things like that. So one thing we're doing in Stockholm is that we're trying to slowly but steadily build uh, a network or find local partners for digital fabrication. And we were very pleased to find this firm that's actually a, a, a special effects um, company that does scenography and um, um, props for movies and theater in Stockholm. And they were crazy enough to take on this project and uh, we had a good uh, collaboration with them, although I think they didn't really make any money from it. <laughs> uh, but, uh, be because it turned out to be difficult to make. But anyway, it was made with, uh, they, they have a, almost like a room size, a room size uh, CNC hot wire cutter for styrofoam. So it's made with styrofoam and then it's hardened with um, uh, 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 a kind of spray on two component uh, surface. <clears throat> so back to the topic of character. Um, we, we recently had a discussion with uh, Michael Young, who I, whom I know has lectured here at the Städelschule, who pointed out to us that sometimes architecture performs in a similar way like a Tarantino movie. So I think what he meant by that is that in a Tarantino movie, you can almost uh, turn on the movie at any frame throughout its length and just enjoy the conversation between quite eccentric characters that inhabit it. There is no linear story. And I think the, the way I see it, uh, those characters can, in architecture for instance, be uh, a ramp, a column or a stair. And also the comment made us think about Le Corbusier's promenade and that the narrative of the building, the, na the narrative in a building that the promenade sets up, it's not necessarily linear, but it depends on how you design that narrative. Uh, and it can also give rise, therefore give rise to many possible readings. So we entered a competition in Denmark a few years ago, and for this project we ended up exploring the concept of character. Um, the competition had close to 500 uh, entries, and we were happy to receive a second prize. And the first prize um, went to a young Russian practice called Cosmos. Maybe some of you know them or know of them. Anyway, um, the competition was to design a museum for Hans Christian Andersen, who is famous for his uh, fairy tales, and who was also born and raised in the city of Odense in Denmark. 
and in the, a challenge in the brief was to incorporate historical buildings into a new scheme for the museum. Uh, like, for instance, the building where the author was born, uh, which is one of those super quaint uh, Danish uh, small houses with a slightly kinked uh, roof. <clears throat> and we quickly found it to be a balancing act to design a museum for a fairy tale author. So, let's say clearly, uh, the House of Fairy Tales should not be a neutral modernist container for exhibitions, but at the same time, it's, it should also avoid two literal connections to the fairy tales of the type that we associate with a coulisse such as Cinderella's castle in Disneyland. And here's our entry, one garden, seven characters. Um, we designed the museum as a set of seven pavilions that enter into a dialogue with H.C. Anderson's birth house and the rotonda. So that's where, why there are nine buildings here. This is the birth house, that's the rotonda, and then our seven pavilions in the garden would be related to those and sort of in a set or a series, uh, but all with their unique proportions and uh, uh, appearance. So we, we, in our entry, we propose to have most of the museum located below ground and to create a large uh, park uh, open to the public uh, of Odense. And the park, in turn, would be populated by these uh, pavilions that consist, that contain activities that normally would be ticketed and uh, not be ticketed, uh, such as bookshops, cafes, and restaurants, whereas the ticketed area would be below ground in galleries. And each pavilion would be placed in such a way that they kind of front an entrance from different points uh, to the city, uh, so, that you, so that you would almost be greeted by one of these pavilions as you entered into the site. So the pavilions would essentially be like mushrooms that pop up from uh, gallery spaces that are hidden underground and that are only visible through a sunken uh, patio or through skylights that are contained in each pavilion. <clears throat> so the, the experience of the museum would then unfold step by step as you would first uh, walk into the garden, uh, uh, perhaps uh, stroll around the pavilions and then, and then enter into the underworld. And here we see the museum as it would never be experienced with the ground uh, kind of pulled away as if it was a tablecloth. So, so here you see the underground galleries, and uh, some of these forms here uh, are uh, because there were, um, we shaped the gallery spaces below ground around uh, large trees that were protected in the garden that couldn't be taken out. So you had to shape the underground around that, basically. And, but also to give the galleries a kind of rhythm uh, that so that walls would start to be, let's say, in conversation with lines of columns and things like that. And finally, a peak inside the garden facing one of the individual pavilions. And now on to found forms and materialities. <clears throat> Here are a couple of uh, examples of found objects in architecture that have informed our work. First, there is the, to the left, there is the ancient practice of uh, spolia, where architectural elements used in construction in one location are repurposed and used in a different location. So these elements, you know, like the column here, for instance, would acquire a new meaning based on their history and how they have been inserted into a new design and juxtaposed against other elements. <clears throat> so like the way, for instance, in which the column uh, here is simultaneously a kind of pilaster, a vertical support, and the framing of an opening. A second contemporary example would be Greg Lynn's uh, recycled toy furniture, uh, that um, from the Biennale in 2008, where plastic toys uh, were um, repurposed, arranged, 
uh, and robotically cut to be fitted uh, into each other. Uh, and while the, I think while these examples have informed uh, how we think about uh, reusing forms of materialities, uh, we, we have done it rather by kind of sampling forms rather than, as you will see, rather than by literally taking pieces of a building, although we're looking forward to working on a project like that as well, probably. <clears throat> but this approach became a starting point uh, for a, a design of a commem 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 commemoration or monument uh, uh, that honors the Poles that rescued the Jews during the German occupation of Warsaw. <laughs> so to make a quick um, uh, recap of that um, uh, terrifying story, um, uh, the story goes that Jews were rescued during the occupation and were hidden at great risk, of course, in the homes of Poles in Warsaw. And so what we did was to <clears throat> sample forms and features that were typical of those rooms in pre-war um, homes in Warsaw. And we, we did so by uh, 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 going to online image banks and tried our best to f find images that would document uh, these homes and base the design off of those. Here is the commemoration cited in the Polin Museum Park uh, in Warsaw, where there is also a new um, museum of Polish history of the, uh, the history of, of the Polish Jews. And unlike a traditional a monument, like a statue, uh, uh, this, is, this is not a monument that you stand in front of, but one that you would uh, enter into and that provides provides a series of rooms for visitors. The project basically features uh, nine open air rooms that appear to have been carved out from a single block of solid concrete. And together, these rooms form a commemoration that consists of a series of public spaces that have a kind of intimate uh, character of um, an apartment or a dom of a domestic space and that uh, may bring about a sense of uh, intimacy or community between visitors and both local residents as well as uh, a lot of uh, tour groups that come here almost like a, a, a pilgrimage. Um, but on another hand, there, the, uh, the, the balance was to you know, take, take those rooms and the familiarity of them and then balance that off of as something that was um, unsettling. So all the rooms are rotated off axis after, as if they have been scrambled or left in a hurry. Here's the interior wall sections with um, moldings pulled from the rooms that we looked at and slightly adjusted so that they open up to the sky and become possible for seating. So each interconnected void has a scale that brings to mind uh, a room, uh, perhaps in an apartment, house, or cabin that belonged to one of the rescuers. <clears throat> and openings between rooms are formed as the voids intersect with each other and with the perimeter of the block. And these openings um, start to direct views uh, and often appear in, in, in old positions like over corners, um, and they also set up a series of sight lines towards other monuments uh, in that park, because that park is filled with monuments from different uh, periods of time. Just before we did the uh, Warsaw project, we, designed a, we, we entered into a competition to design a proposal for public furniture in a really strange coastal town uh, called Karosta in Latvia. Uh, I don't know if any of you uh, are from Latvia or have been to Karosta, but it's, a, it's a, basically a ghost town uh, that's full of abandoned and decaying buildings. Uh, uh, but, it, but it's also home to a vibrant art community. community. Uh, and part of the allure that has attracted tourism and also the art community there is a special kind of sort of hipster tourism uh, 
sometimes known as ruin porn. So people travel here to look at ru buildings that are in a state of decay, basically, and um, uh, enjoy the ghost town. <clears throat> so our project rethinks uh, Carosta's new urban furniture, which was the subject of the competition. So things like bus stops, seating modules, playgrounds, information posts, as large hollowed, ho hollowed out objects. And when working with, the, with this project, we also considered um, the power of images in, in our culture today. And I think, you know, just from uh, be, being, in, I'm sure for you guys being in, in architecture school, uh, you know, the, the kind of boom that has happened uh, uh, with in Instagram and architecture, that Instagram has almost, like as superficial as it is, it has almost become a tool to follow what's going on in, in interesting institutions and practices around the world. Uh, and in a similar way, um, um, you can think of how images nowadays perhaps construct a place. So you construct a place not just by being on site or dwelling there, but also through images and by sharing images. Um, so in, in a kind of very blunt, straightforward way, our scheme acknowledges that by letting each piece of furniture frame views in surprising ways and set up new sight lines ac across the uh, kind of non um, functional uh, urban fabric of Carosta. So there are lots of um, uh, selfie benches where you could, you know, you have a perfect sight line to the Grand Cathedral and could sit here and, and, and make a selfie. <clears throat> so being a, the thing with Carosta is that the reason why it was abandoned was that it, it, it was a, a Soviet era naval base and was abandoned in the 80s. Uh, but it was also an important town during the Tsar era. So that means that there are like two worlds present in the town at the same time. One is, uh, for instance, the cathedral that's all kind of um, golden and uh, flamboyant. And on the other hand, um, there are the um, abandoned and sometimes even not finished um, uh, Soviet era blockhouses. And also the naval base in itself with old eroded bunkers. And as a play on that, we designed each piece of furniture so that it houses uh, those uh, uh, two material worlds, separated through distinctions between outside and inside, or front side and back side. <clears throat> so on one side, you have uh, 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 perfect mitered corners, reflective paint, uh, and uh, thicknesses and tectonics would be uh, hidden. And on, an, on another side you have uh, surfaces that are braced with and subdivided by grid uh, that works as an armature uh, for a mix of uh, cement and ballast uh, that creates an intense materiality. And the idea was that those two worlds between begin to forge relationships between with the unique qualities of Carosta. So here's the um, uh, here's an axon that shows how the sightline of each uh, view whether pointing to an insign insignificant house or the grand cathedral would become the basis of a projection that hollows out a cubic volume. And as in the previous project, uh, Nine Rooms, it's about, to, um, it, it's about um, thinking about geometry as mass and material. So you, for those of you who use software, Boolean logics. But here the voids intersect much more uh, uh, so that they, um, spaces are, are loosely suggested rather than more defined like in the other project. Uh, and each void thus created is programmed with seating, uh, rooms for play, and information displays, and so on. And the idea would be that as these furniture are distributed throughout Carosta, uh, the sight lines that they uh, begin to set up uh, create a series of spatial relationships between furniture and sites, and between furniture and furniture, which um, 
we thought was something important since normally in a city, you, the way that you view sites are regulated through things like axial relationships and they're, you, know, they're, you approach a building or a, an important site in a controlled way thanks to a street pattern. But in Karosta, that's, that's all kind of half finished and uh, not um, uh, um, appropriately designed, basically. Finally, here's the playground on the beach with some eroded bunkers in the background. This too was an open competition and again we received a second prize and <clears throat> uh, it, that seems to be kind of both a curse and a blessing for our practices that we have uh, by now uh, received quite a few second, second prizes but are still waiting for a first prize. <laughs> Uh, so finally, on to um, supergroups. Um, so having worked with individual buildings um, in a set, like in the H.C. Anderson Museum, we started to become interesting, interested in what would happen if you would bunch those individual buildings together in a tight group. So it was, would almost be something like in, uh, like in still life painting where one composition or one mass is created by bringing several discrete objects together and where color, form and depth work to distinguish objects from each other. So that the result would be one building but with multiple identities. This would be uh, like the architectural equivalent of a supergroup in music where each member of a group is a star or is able to express their, individually, their individuality in their own right. Like in these historical projects by uh, Geary and Kahn, for instance. And as a principle for composition, the supergroup uh, to us seemed to be an interesting alternative to uh, other models like cohesion, as in, for instance, uh, flock. Or, uh, on the other hand, it's also not exactly fragmented as in a collage, since each member of the group is a whole in its own right. So compositionally, it's more like a curated collection, or sometimes mess, of different wholes being bunched together. Another well-known example uh, of this phenomenon would be the Piranesi map of um, Campo Marzo in Rome that shows like a sea of, as you all know, fictional, partly fictional buildings packed on top of each other. Uh, so a couple of years we, uh, ago we explored this approach for a competition for a new cultural center in Skellefteå, a small um, city far up north in Sweden. And um, the, as always when you have, a, when, when you have an idea, you the, you know, the, and you're, you're thrown into a project, and that project seemed to be an ideal way to explore that idea. <laughs> uh, so the story with this project was basically that the city wanted to collect several existing cultural institutions into a new, larger, major hub for um, culture and events, so what, what in Sweden is known as a, a culture house that typically in, has both um, uh, art galleries, a library, um, theater, and those things bunched together in one building. So here we see uh, these institutions as building blocks uh, on, in and of their own, and here assembled into the, the, uh, the mass of the building. So each building in the center corresponds to a one existing cultural institution in Skellefteå. So there is a theater, a rotunda for the library, art galleries, staff offices, um, a new convention center and a, a music stage and a hotel. And then a plinth that keeps them all together uh, and contains uh, ticketing and uh, part of the library. And again, I think that uh, this approach uh, to us was interesting because it allows for multiple identities 
and productive adjacencies and overlaps between these two programs, but without uh, fully fusing them into one building or into one mass. Zooming out, um, uh, this in addition became a response to the indeterminate nature of the urban fabric in the city and the, in the center of Coleftio, which as you can see is kind of a hodgepodge of different buildings. It's not, it's not exactly a perimeter block structure. Uh, um, um, so the site, our building on the site would essentially be like a densified version of that sort of mess that was already existing on the site. Um, and this is maybe where the Campo Marzio reference come in, comes in, that uh, the, the, the group form approach resulted in a complex interior, as you can see, an almost urban condition with junctions, piazzas, and landmarks. Uh, so it's like a city consisting only of tightly packed architecture. <clears throat> so this would be the entrance level with foyers, um, library, and all the technical spaces below, loading base. I, I'm not going to bore you with the details, but. <clears throat> and first floor plan with the theaters, auditoria, and upper foyers. And here you begin to see traces also of the, of the different discrete masses that rests on top of the podium. And a typical floor plan above the theaters with the hotel tower to the left, staff offices, and the art gallery. And the upper, the upper foyers looking down to the library below. We were also fortunate in this project to be working with two um, structural engineers. So we, we were able to um, think through and refine structure in ways that we haven't been able to in other competitions perhaps. And here is a view from the square facing the city center um, that also says maybe something about um, the institutional identity that this design would create and how it would uh, announce itself to the visitor. So the way in which, for instance, the, uh, the, the informal way in which the, uh, the buildings on top of the, the masses on top of the podium are assembled, we, we'd like to think that that also affects the identity of the place as a whole and gives it a kind of informal and playful identity. Uh, and we're also happy uh, uh, to, be, uh, to have been invited to exhibit this, this project um, this fall in an ex exhibition titled Adjacencies that Nate Hume is uh, putting together at Yale School of Architecture in the US. <clears throat> so last project, um, we were asked uh, last year by an architecture practice involved uh, in planning um, a new residential neighborhood in the city of Malmö on the southern tip of Sweden to participate in an exhibition called Common in Kids, where 13 young Nordic practices were given a specific site and a theme to explore. And the idea was kind of that uh, normally, at least, in, I, I don't know how, how it is in, in, in Germany, but for quite a while in Sweden there has been a housing boom, meaning that a lot of new, new housing is is, there is a demand for new housing and new housing areas are being planned, but unlike, let's say, in the 60s, uh, public func functions are not added in the same, at the same rate. So you would, you, would, you, you would, let's say, have a lot of new housing, but no new library or no new theater or no new, yeah. So the idea with this exhibition was that, uh, and project was that, what if you could insert those public function, functions on a kind of micro scale level in new, smaller uh, residential areas that are planned. So each uh, participating office was tasked with a particular function, a uh, particular program. We were tasked with consumption. Some others were tasked with, for instance, uh, religion or um, I don't remember them all. <clears throat> but for our project called CEG Market, uh, we, and CEG is the neighborhood where the project is placed, uh, we started to look at collaborative consumption and the current situation uh, where, where sharing economy is becoming important in society and where objects and experiences are sold or exchanged uh, or shared online 
you know, in basically in things that have been around for a, for a long time, like eBay, but also through much more informal networks. And what that means uh, is, is, is that in a neighborhood like this, everyone would potentially be a consumer or a producer or a merchant. But the, the, the question perhaps is how, how could we as architects develop a physical infrastructure for this phenomena and for the kind of endless flow of objects that con continuously exchange hands but that lacks uh, an architectural manifestation? In terms of experience, we were interested in creating a, ver creating a very intense agglomeration of all this stuff, of all the objects. So what if the spatial experience of a building or a site was defined by, not so much by the architecture, but by all the objects or belongings? And here's the uh, Sir John Soane's house in London, perhaps some of you have visited. And this is the same house, but with all of Zone's collections. And as you know, Zone collected uh, uh, anti an antiquities and uh, basically customized the whole house around the integration of those objects. And also, um, uh, even some of the um, um, cupolas and uh, parts of the buildings behind the frontal, behind the front facade were based off of uh, uh, were, were his interpretation of historical buildings on other sites. It's an, it's an amazing house. If you haven't visited it, you should. And comp uh, to be honest, compared to Sir John Soane's Son's house, our project is, ac is actually quite modest. But anyway, what, what we did uh, was to design an, an open structure, basically uh, just a three by three meter grid. A bit, um, uh, um, um, a post and lintel structure. And together, the floor and the columns define 16 bookable spaces in which everything from food to furniture to vehicles can be shown and exchange owners. It's like a board game, but where the, it would be like a board game, but where content changes constantly. So the, the market would be protected by a plastic envelope that can be opened or closed, but where you would see all the objects on display. And three larger objects, movable objects, would populate it permanently. A foldable bar, a seating platform, and a ladder. So these objects would appear as kind of colorful silhouettes in the room and uh, um, provide services. So it was not so much the framework uh, provided by the structure that interested us, but the object in themselves and how they would sort of begin to dwell in it, which is something that we explored uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a model. And together, the, the colorful masses of objects um, would form a landscape of you know, compression and uh, expansion where spaces are formed by the stuff on display. So where you know, suddenly an alley or uh, a portal would appear thanks to objects that are on display. We imagine the, the market to be a bit like a construction site, you know, where you would walk by every day and something has changed and um, objects would circulate through it. And where unexpected adjacencies between different objects and activities would stir conversation and exchange between residents and visitors. <clears throat> so in the model, we, ba we, we began to, as a quite silly game, just to imagine what would happen if a mobile home stands next to a flamingo, that's next to a rocking chair, that's next to an inflatable pool, and so on. And where the identity of the building as a whole would be in constant uh, flux, depending on what was on display. I don't know how I'm doing with time, but that's it. <laughs> sure. I see that you employ a lot of colors and different, in, across all your projects, for 
for different purposes. Like in, in the last one, for example, the uh, frameworks are all pure white, but the objects have to populate it with our specific color. Uh, or in the, the Pavilion project, where the cover colors are used as these aesthetics to point out different markers in the garden. Yet in the uh, characters, the first project that you showed, where the reference images of these objects which are found in Sweden had so much uh, information uh, with colors and the objects that you picked up themselves. But then when you're making that final one, there is no color, it's black. Mm. So why did you choose to lose the information that color provides there, one? And in that project itself, there's also a loss of the idea of materiality that was very integral to those objects that were there. So, so sorry, there was what, what was there a loss of? Uh, just one is the idea of color and the idea that it was, uh, it's, it's the character's project. The first project that you showed, the exhibition yeah. that you did. So there is, in the reference images there was so much information that you do not put in the final one because that final object is black. Mm, yeah. <clears throat> well, I think the, 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 the straightforward answer to the question would be that color can do different jobs. Like in, in the case of the um, dead ringers, then, then uh, the idea was to make new, um, new figures or new masses that would appear as, as one, uh, rather than fra to fragment each f formal feature using a color. While, for instance, in the, um, uh, some of the later products I showed, uh, color use, is used to, to make objects even more distinct than they are. So to really emphasize each building mass, for instance. But overall, you're right in pointing out that we like to use color. Yeah. <laughs> no, I felt like in Red Ringers, the project itself, uh, why did you, like I understand there was the idea of integration of mass and everything, but the, I think the Dead Ringers project had a larger agenda to even remind people of traces of objects that they have seen within the city. So, but still you, you make this conscious decision of losing, of giving away that information. I just want to know why that that information does not get you know, I, 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 yeah, I mean, I think that's, um, that's a balancing act. That's, um, uh, it, because the products and, and, and quite a few of the products are about how you read something or how, you, uh, how there's communication happening between architecture and an audience. That, that's a balancing act always. That's, de that's depending on context and cultural preferences. And so I think that the, um, uh, in in, in, when it comes to the dead ringers, it's a matter of uh, balancing recognizable features, but also uh, w by uh, muting them. So that I, I think if, if it's too obvious, then it's like obviously it's, it, it's, no, it's not interesting anymore, but it's interesting when the object becomes interesting when, when uh, you recognize it slowly rather than instantly. I'm wondering, I'm wondering if you think uh, at the very beginning you say in conversation and you speak about the uh, audience. I, you, know, you, you state some references, I would imagine also. Now, yes, that there are the references that are crucial for you in, in, in terms of um, in the design, but they're also almost like the, in terms of the, not the profile, but the interest in designing this of the office. Sure. But when you say when you go about a particular project, does this also enter into your planning of the design, how you strategize it, in, in terms of what audience you want to address? Do you, do you engage, do you actively engage with, um, with, um, with what you set out to begin with, being in conversation with audiences, do you actively set that up in the work? Or is it more a meta reflection on, on what architecture may do? 
I think when, I mean, obviously as an architect there are always two kinds of audiences. One, one is the public or someone who would encounter the built work and the other, another audience is, uh, let's say, the client or the, the, the city. Uh, but I think between those two, I think we, 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 at least up until now, we focus much more on the public and on how, like, uh, how um, the context in which a, a product would be placed and um, um, if, it's a, if it's a public institution, also the identity of that institution and how architecture possibly could shape that identity. I thought we were going to say in conversation with other architects. Oh, okay. Well, um, that too is very important, yes. Uh, but that, that, that's a nice uh, angle <laughs> that I haven't thought of myself, but yes, of course. And um, um, I think a lot of, like, I, I think my, in, in a way that I made that clear by, you know, referencing conversations that we have had with other architects and, yeah. But of course, that, that pl plays a big role. So when I look at the work, I mean, obviously, some of these projects are small scale because they are exhibition projects. They probably, compared to a, a fully fledged urban project, they probably have many school projects. And, and, uh, so, so for that reason, they are, per definition, small scale. But there's also, um, that was the, was that the music, the culture center? That's actually the, relatively speaking, that's a larger project. And still, um, you're dealing with it as in, there's this very charming, and I mean this in a, as a compliment, this very charming and playful, if not almost whimsical character mm. in the work. Um, and in the photocultural center, when you can do a lot of scale, you actually put so many of the functions then on the ground, and you still have your smaller scale objects. Uh, occupying the field. Mm. Is there a particular reason for that? This engagement? So, in other words, it seems to me that small scale is not only for chance given the, the nature of a particular project. So, do is also something that you pursue. That we might touch. Yeah. So, I'm asking if that is preserved for what reason. What, is the, what are your thoughts about scale? And how would you, hypothetically, translate into a very large scale? Do you think that you retain some of the characteristics of the work in, in working on a much larger scale and, and a much more consolidated mass? Um, that's a philosophical question, but... Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. I think that's something we, we have to figure out. How, I, I think the Coleftio project was an attempt like with those large uh, blocks, that, that, that's a, um, that was a 20,000 square meter plus um, building. But I, I think your, I mean, your observation is right, that it has been our um, um, an, uh, impulse to, to break the building down, rather than to like the opposite of a kind of bigness approach, yeah. Um, but and I think one reason is one reason for that is this interesting group form, um, and what that do to. So it's, it's I'm sorry to intervene on that, but it's kind of uh, let's say working from almost uh, critical reading of uh, uh, some of my years. So not going really into that bigness like gross form, but reading that as a group, group form, which is a kind of conceptual. Is it something that makes things magical? 
but not as legible as if it was just a collage. Or, or let's say, because you use from the, the, the quote from, from Kent Frampton and this idea of kind of communication. So I, this is the question, what is the, in, in your case, this kind of mix between explicit group form and kind of implicit idea of uh, the fragment that becomes an animation figure that is never finished. You know? So there is a certain ambiguity. Mm. I, can, I can almost detect two questions in this question. <laughs> One question would be the, like whether, you know, whether drawing or like orthographic projection play, plays a role as a, as a, in the design process. And the other one would be about, um, again, this question of um, playing with the identity and you know, faint resemblances or things like that. So I think, I think with the first question, um, I mean, uh, I think that's a matter of, um, you know, both Einar and I, we were educated mostly during the um, um, mid to uh, late, um, um, what do you call it, noughts, <laughs> zero zeros, <laughs> at the time when uh, there was almost like a, um, it was it was taken for granted that the way that you use digital design and in particular uh, modeling would be that you start from 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 lines and then you build from lines to surfaces to objects and you that that becomes this uh, very sort of um, finicky process where you can um, push and pull things you where essentially and where you work always in first person camera so um, Having been sort of educated in all of that, I think that we and probably others too uh, st started to think about w what if there's a way of using, you know, all the powers of uh, digital design, but 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 reconnect with orthographic drawing as a means of understanding or, or even uh, uh, executing a design, as in, for instance, the Dead Ringers project, where you know those elevations produce the object. But that wouldn't be that would be very difficult to do without uh, modeling software. But it still uh, it still relies on uh, some of the it plays with the convention of orthographic drawing. Um, but then there is this kind of access of information, I guess, where uh, tool becomes something that is kind of implicitly present because it produces this kind of partial figures that can be read through elevation mostly, and they never form a, you know they never form like a full body. Yeah. As if it was, let's say, in the postmodern. So this is maybe why it's a post-digital project that way, right? Because it uses that idea of uh, kind of partial carving out the animation. Mm. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me.